All right. So this is uh, meant to be a discussion. It's a core conversation, so I hope this session will be very interactive. Um, but I do want to kick it off with a few slides. Um, there's a couple of things that I didn't, um, a couple of survey results that I didn't share in the keynote because it was too much. And I've actually some more things to share. I'm going to share some more here, but I will also be sharing more on my blog. Um, but one of the questions that we asked is, um, you know, if people contribute to a Drupal, yes or no. And of the people that answered the survey, we can see it on the screen. Well, it's really small here, but 765 uh, of those people were contributors. Um, and then there was a question whether they're volunteer or paid contributors. And um, you, you, know, you can see the results there. Uh, some people clearly checked both. If they're both paid and volunteer, because otherwise the math wouldn't work. Um, uh, but you know, I think it's um, I think it's a great number actually, and uh, it also actually suggests that the survey may have some participation bias, right? I mean, people, a lot of the people that um, checked or uh, filled out the survey have um, checked that they're also contributing. Um, all right, I can't even read this from here, nor from, from it. So I think this shows the roles, is that right? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's too small on my screen and I can't read it sideways from this angle. Um, so I'll just, I'll just let you, uh, you read it. I believe when I looked at it earlier, I said things that roughly half of the people, um, you know, what is this? I'm sorry, all right, these are the different roles. Okay, never mind. <laughs> And so I think it's also important to recognize that you know, there's many, many ways um, of contributing. And so when people filled out that they're contributing, uh, could mean contributing to core, to contrib, or helping with events, um, you know, organizing user groups, you know, all of these things. And so first of all, I'd like to thank all of the people that contributed. And I know many of you are in the room, so thank you for um, being contributors. This is also an interesting graph, which originally ha I had put in the keynote. Um, but we've done these surveys with every major release of Drupal. And so we did one in 2008, um, 2011, and 2016. And consistently across all of the surveys, we asked the question um, whether you get paid um, to contribute and to work with Drupal, um, or if you're uh, doing it in your spare time as a hobbyist. And one of the things you see is that um, over the last eight years, um, you know, we've lost a lot of hobbyists, basically. Or they got hired. Or, they got hired. Yeah. <laughs> they, or the hobbyists became, um, you know, non-hobbyists, but even so, there should be an inflow of hobbyists, I would say. And so I think what it shows is, is kind of a, a maturation, almost, of the community, uh, where more and more people are doing Drupal professionally. Uh, and it's, as we probably all recognize, it's, it's at least partially driven by Drupal kind of becoming more uh, powerful, more flexible, and therefore also uh, less easy you know, to use, less accessible for people that just wanna, wanna do things quickly. Um, I think the other thing I would say on this slide is that um, you know, when, when I started Drupal, and to some extent still in 2008, there weren't as many um, you know, software as a service solutions available. I also, like even if Drupal stay as, um, as simple, if you will, as it were in 2008, I still believe this number would have gone down dramatically given um, like tools like uh, Squarespace and the likes are just, you know, better alternatives in many ways for, uh, you know, hobbyists. Um, so. All right, so uh, barriers to uh, contribution. Uh, go back and your slide deck. All right, Sorry. slides are ready. <laughs> okay, hold on. Maybe I'll unplug it for a second, it makes it easier. Sorry, one day we'll tell stories about that. 
Remember how Dries already walked up on stage and set up and we were still pulling together slides? Sorry. Let's fast forward. Ta da! Here is a slide. <laughs> so this is a slide from the from the survey, and so one of the questions um, was around you know barriers to contributions. What is what are your frustrations with the with the contribution process? It may be a little hard to read, actually, but um, the first two bars, the ones with um, you know with the most um, points, if you will, um, are, you know, bugs and patches aren't being reviewed quickly in the queue, so people being frustrated with that taking a long time. And then also roughly half of the people, uh, half of the contributors that answered this question, um, they also said that the uh, issue queue is too complex and that there is too much consensus building. So these are the top two bars and uh, the colors are what contributors answered uh, about the process and what everybody answered about the process, even those that are not contributing. So, you know, they may still have an opinion based on what they hear. Um, and so you can see the results are fairly consistent. Um, GitHub was actually only number five on the list, I think. Is that on there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually also interesting that was uh, one out of uh, seven people or something said there's no challenges with contributing whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Liars. <laughs> um, so in addition to that, um, we also did another, um, we also did another thing. So we created this um, contributions barrier assessment and it's outside of the survey um, as I mentioned, and we, we worked with the core committers and the core mentors and, and other people, and we asked them, what are the barriers for contribution? And so we identified over a hundred of those, right? And we put them all in a spreadsheet, and then we evaluated them each uh, based on a, a number of criteria, um, specifically impact, like how, what is the impact of solving this barrier to contribution? Uh, and then how difficult is it to fix the barrier? And so we can then hopefully find the ones that are easy to fix with high impact. And so you see a little screenshot of that uh, here. Um, and of course the idea is that for each of those, we're gonna create an issue in the queue so we can have conversations about them and, and work together on, on solutions. Uh, and so we will share more details about this, I think, I don't know in the future. <laughs> All right, so I wanna talk a little bit more about these things. Um, I combined these two top items into, into this. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things we've already done. Um, and again, it's hard to read from here, but um, um, yeah, so one of the things we started doing is um, the RTBCQ is something that we now watch very closely. In the past, uh, sometimes issues would sit in the RTBC queue for a long time. Um, but now the core committers, it's almost like a daily routine, if you will, to go over the RTBC queue and to make sure it's uh, pretty empty. And, um, uh, you know, I feel like the team has done an incredible job at that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, also, governance is something. Um, that I've definitely spent a good amount of time on in the last year. And so we, um, we've been evolving our governance process and as you probably know, one of the things we've done is we clearly identified uh, different roles, like a product manager role, uh, release manager, framework manager, and subsystem maintainers. And um, I think that helps in the decision making. Uh-oh. No, here, you can uh, have awesome. it. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. 
you can actually see the slides. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, governance process. So, so that actually is also very helpful because you know when it comes when an issue is stuck in, in bike shedding, I think it's now much more clear who can make the decision on, on how to unblock the the, uh, the issue. It's something we've been doing. Um, we've also been making improvements to automa automated testing infrastructure. Um, that includes JavaScript testing that we recently added. Thank you, Drupal Association. Um, <laughs> now we just need to write a whole bunch of JavaScript tests, <laughs> which we don't have a lot of yet. <laughs> but the JavaScript test will be critical um, because you know, even in my keynote, I started showing some um, you know, vision mockups uh, using outside in and using much more application like behavior and uh, more likely than not we'll see more and more JavaScript um, you know in core and so having these tests is uh, is, is very important for us to um, to be able to do that um, in addition to that we're also able to do testing against um, multiple platforms now and so we have um, you know, multiple different databases, um, MySQL, different versions, Postgres, um, even um, you know non -real, uh, you know non MySQL databases, um, also PHP seven, and so I think it's six combinations or something that we can use now uh, to test against, which is uh, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, also in that is um, we've been working on um, our work is underway on being able to check sort of the coding standards in an automated way, which will also be very helpful to um, speed up the patch review process. And as you guys know, we have a lot of different rules <laughs> around coding standards. Um, and so being able to automate that will help everybody. Um, and then last but not least, I think the initiatives also really help um, because uh, an initiative creates focus. And I think some of the frustration happens when somebody uploads a patch that you know, they believe is a great idea, but nobody else truly cares about. And you know, obviously that patch will end up sitting in the queue. But um, if we have initiatives and we you know, articulate sort of where we wanna see contribution uh, happen, hopefully when people do contribute something uh, along these uh, strategic initiatives, these patches will be reviewed more you know, faster. So I think focus helps, um, so that's good news too. Next slide. Uh, quarter mentoring uh, is also critical and deserves its own slide. Um, the core mentoring program has now trained hundreds, you know, thousands of people really. Uh, there's hundreds of mentors all around the world and what they do is they help people contribute. And in that process, they help them overcome all sorts of barriers. Um, same, same thing this week at the sprint, so if you're stuck on a barrier, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. There will be core mentors and they can help you overcome these barriers. So again, big thank you to, to all of the mentors, the sprint organizers, the sprint leads. Um, I think all of your work is uh, critical in, in helping people feel comfortable with uh, contributing to Drupal. So. <laughs> Semantic versioning, I uh, also talked about it in my keynote, uh, but the idea that we can um, you know, keep innovating, is, I think is very exciting. At least a lot of people I talked to this week, that was one of their highlights, even though I feel like we've talked about it multiple times. <laughs> but the fact that they see it in action, that they see that we shipped Drupal 8.1 uh, on time and with new features, um, got a lot of people excited. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, if you look at some of the, uh, in this image is a little bit more uh, detailed, but what you see effectively is that once we open um, or you know, start the beta process, we already open the next branch. And so the red line, if you will, or red bar is a, you know, it's kind of like continuous, meaning Drupal is always open uh, for people to, um, you know, to uh, contribute patches and for us to accept patches. Um, so I think it's, um, Something that the team also really spent a lot of time thinking about and revising, like how do we manage all of these branches? And uh, I think uh, very pleased with the way it came out and how it's working. So that will also help with that issue. Um, then we're also planning to do you know, a bunch of things uh, in the future. So one of the big topics 
um, of uh, this uh, DrupalCon is that we're you know, working on a new planning process for initiatives, and I talked a little bit about it in my keynote with planned initiatives um, or proposed planned and active initiatives. Um, and it, we're not doing that just for initiatives, but we're making similar kind of um, you know, changes for you know, features and, and usability and design process. Like I think in general, we're trying to move the Drupal um, community to be you know, a little bit mature, more mature development process. And I think that's really important because often what happens is people spend sometimes weeks or months building a feature uh, and then people come in and they say, well, why, why are we even doing this thing, <laughs> right? And so sometimes that means, um, you know, these, these things get blocked. And so if we can do more planning up front and have, you know, sort of sign-offs along the way that avoids that things, people spend a lot of time doing something and that work then being kind of wasted, right? So the, the whole idea of the process is not to do necessarily more planning, but to avoid the people uh, spend time doing things which will never, you know, make it into core. And the same thing with, um, you know, with UX, for example. Um, it's something where we, frankly, have been lacking process. And so it's really important that we introduce better process around these things. Again, uh, especially in the context of the other survey results where people want us to spend a lot of time or a lot of focus working on improving, um, you know, site, you know, editorial features for both content authors as well as site builders. So it's a lot about, a lot about that is about um, user interfaces. <clears throat> experimenting with experimenting, experimental modules um, is also something that's relatively new. I mean, we started doing it, but we have to do more experimentation. So the idea is we can. The idea is actually something we borrowed from the Linux kernel. Um, when I was <clears throat> still compiling my own kernel <laughs> um, in 1995, um, this was something that was uh, available in Linux. I'm not sure how many of you rem remember that, um, but um, we could like enable experimental modules or experimental features. And so it's something that we're now also doing in Drupal. And, um, the Migrate UI is an experimental module today, and it allows us to be more flexible, allows us to put things in core faster, uh, and then to iterate on it while it's still in core, while not having to worry as much about you know, making big changes to it. Um, so again, it's an interesting way to innovate, uh, and it should also help us commit things a little bit faster, um, because there is less risk in, in committing something early on. Um, uh, some, something else that we're working on uh, is the ability to check patches, um, you know, to check if they still apply automatically, and if they do, to try and automatically re-roll them. It's something that people spend a lot of time on, re-rolling patches, and I think uh, I heard a number like about a third of the patches or something can be automatically re-rolled. So it could be a huge time saver for, for a, um, you know, for all of us, but also people would get the quick feedback that the patch could be re-rolled, um, so they're no longer blocked on somebody telling them that. <laughs> and then many, many, many more things. All right, here you can see um, an image which I believe was used in, in a presentation that Gabor and Angie gave. Uh, they gave a talk about um, introducing, you know, more agility in the, in the planning process. Um, the feedback that I heard is that that talk was extremely well received, uh, so very exciting. Um, and as I mentioned, the idea is to validate ideas early before writing code um, to prototype, um, you know, either on paper or even just HTML and CSS without even writing something that works with Drupal and to go test it with real users. <laughs> um, and again, in combination with experimental modules, I think that could be pretty, um, you know, pretty exciting change. All right, um, then there's also been a lot of conversations about the different initiatives, and um, I proposed about nine initiatives or something. Um, the exciting news is um, 
that the workflow initiative, the API first initiatives, and, and most likely the blocks and layout initiatives have funding. So we're probably gonna focus with these. I mean, there, there's people waiting to start working on these things so we can get going um, with those. And I think we'll try this new planning process on them. I'm sure we'll learn a lot and have to tweak a lot, but um, so the next step, we just had a meeting actually um, with Boyan and Roy and Gabor and Angie, and we talked about um, sort of the product management uh, part of these initiatives, and we're gonna start working with these three initiatives and then hopefully with all of the other initiatives as well, and uh, try and make them successful by helping them do things like prioritizing um, the features within these initiatives, because initiatives are more like strategic directions, right? Um, like workflow. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so we need to figure out workflow, what exactly do we mean by workflow, what are all the features around workflow, and which fe features will we work on first. Um, and then obviously communication and prototyping, all of these things. So pretty exciting about that, and uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. How do we fix more of these barriers? The long list that I showed you in the spreadsheet. Well, first of all, with your help. As I mentioned, we're gonna create an issue for each of those things. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love your help trying to fix them. Uh, the Drupal Association has, as I mentioned, made several changes that help us and they will hopefully continue to make those changes uh, on improving D2O. Um, and then, uh, you know, lots of conversations between all the different stakeholders, if you will, core committers and the working groups and the, and the contributors, trying to figure out how to make our process better, how to make our tools better, and, uh, you know, and also people, frankly. Usually it comes down to process tools and people, and so we need to make sure we have the right people on the bus, in the right seats, um, and that's also an ongoing effort. And last but not least, and Jess was the champion of this, but uh, I, you know, I buy, I buy into it as well, is that making contribution easier is actually one of the most valuable ways to contribute, right? I think, if you think about the number of people that come to D2O, um, I think it's over a million people a month, right? And so it's a little bit like a funnel, like a million people come to the website, then X people download Drupal, or learn how to install Drupal, and then of those people that install Drupal, you know, uh, why people actually end up using Drupal. And from the people that end up using Drupal, you know, Z amount is actually turning into a contributor. And so the better we can streamline the whole process from discovering Drupal to installing Drupal to be learning Drupal to becoming a Drupal expert and a contributor, um, you know, the better it will be for Drupal. So it's a, it's a work that really affects anyone. You know, anyone that contributes help, helps with that funnel, if you will. If you help write documentation, well, that widens the funnel there. If you help with uh, improvements to D2O, it helps, it helps as well. So, um, thanks for all the help. So that's what I wanted to share. Um, and at, at this point, I would love to open it up for discussion. Um, the risk here is that um, everybody starts to, you know, share, you know, set, Here's what we should do, and here's what we should do, um, which is useful. Um, so I prepared a few questions. Uh, actually, one of the things I would be interested in is, is getting a little bit of feedback on the proposed initiatives. So going back to the keynote, um, if people have thoughts on, on those initiatives. Um, and then, you know, if you have ideas on how people can contribute to, to those initiatives. Um, I'm also interested in, um, experiences that compare Drupal to other projects. I'm sure many of you are active in other projects as well, and I think you can always learn from other projects, um, and so we'd, we'd be curious about that. Um, and then, yeah, if you have ideas for what the number one uh, barrier is, we would, we would love to hear that as well. I think there is a mic, if you, might, if you don't mind coming up to the mic. The reason is I think we are recording these sessions. So that way people can listen to them. And feel free to line up if you have questions. So uh, one of the, oh, it's really loud. Um, one of the things I liked about the keynote this year, um, so for a lot of the new initiatives, you have sort of these nice 
UX mockups. You know, you have an animation that kind of demonstrates the process, the intention. Um, and I think that's really valuable, but one of the things in general that I'm not sure about, I mean, you can give me some insight, and um, like I'm a digital strategist, so I, I work with Drupal, I'm experienced as a developer, but now I want to focus on how things work, right? Um, you know, inside the contrib space, um, what's the process for that? How does, a UX, how does a digital strategist actually step in and say, this whole, you know, this initiative makes sense, but you actually need to sit down and figure out your user flows, specific user stories, because I think most of Drupal Contrib is based around sort of the developer-centric side of it, but where's the other side, right? How do we get there where uh, we can actually map out a user flow, wireframe, build? Yeah, so that is a key question, right? And um, as we, you know, as I mentioned, we're gonna spend way more time on sort of the user flow because a lot of the features that are on the proposed initiative list are user-focused, and I think where we have a weakness, frankly, is in, in you know, what you just described, whether you call it digital strategist or product management or user experience design, like figuring out how, how, we, uh, how we do that is gonna be key. And, and it's gonna be a little painful for some of you, you know, because we have to, we have to do things differently. Um, I think because we're such a technical community, we have been, uh, we tend to, we, we tend to say things like, all right, first we need to rewrite the whole API. And after we've rewritten the whole API, we can then start to build user interfaces on top of that or something, right? Or if you don't refactor this now, we won't be able to refactor it later. But I think we need to find a good balance between making progress on user interfaces as well as um, at the same time, I'm sure we'll have to do API work as well, but it may actually require us to think a little bit different uh, about how we develop Drupal and, and make different trade-offs. Um, having said that, to come back to your question, uh, for each of these initiatives, we're gonna build a team. I mean, and one of the things we've learned from Drupal 7 is that if, if there's not a well-rounded team for an initiative, these initiatives can really struggle sometimes. And so that's why now we have proposed initiatives and planned initiatives and sort of started initiatives, and we're only gonna start an initiative if we have a good plan, and that plan arguably should include, um, you know, wireframes or, you know, these kinds of things that are tested. And so what that means is that before an initiative even starts, we're gonna have to get the right people involved that can help us with these things. And um, we'll see how that goes. Sounds like we have at least one volunteer. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks for this discussion. The, um, I was wondering, where does the funding for these initiatives come from? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, well, they can come from everywhere. <laughs> um, the workflow initiative, um, you know, I showed some of the names on the slides and, and the company that they're affiliated with. And so um, the workflow initiative is effectively Pfizer. Uh, that has stepped up and said, hey, we use Drupal, we really benefit from Drupal, and we want to give back to Drupal. So in, in that case, it's you know, like a, actually the first time, I would say, that a, a, a user of Drupal, an end user of Drupal, is, is stepping up to contribute in, in such a big way, which is kind of awesome to see. Um, the a API First initiative um, and the Blocks and Layout initiative um, you know, putting my Acquia head on, I'm willing to fund through Acquia. You know, if people think these initiatives are a good idea, we'll, uh, we'll work on them. So, and then, you know, hopefully other people will step up to, to fund some of the other initiatives. I have a hypothesis that one of the reasons that kind of the hobbyist contributor is falling off is that a lot of the low-hanging fruit that that you feel like you can get in there and make a, a difference in a small number of hours has really been kind of gobbled up. And the, the contrib space, there's a lot of stuff that just to get your head around a module takes a long time. Have you put any thought into how we help decompose the work and match skill sets so that somebody can know, okay, I know I need a novice issue, but here's maybe the kind of issue I should go after as opposed to just going through the issue queues and hoping they find something that fits. Yeah, we, we actually do tag issues with novice 
Um, not sure if you knew that, or is that just what you mentioned? You knew that? Uh, I know there are issues there. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, recording. I, I know that there is like the, the novice tag, but right. even within that, there is sort of the, it, it, you know, we had a fellow who's a digital strategist, and you've got people who are more front end. Um, just knowing that it's a novice issue, I don't know necessarily gives the casual contributor the sense of, is it a fit for them, and is there kind of an estimate of how long it should take so they know that, yeah, th this is the one I should jump in on. Because if you just sort by the novice tag, that's hundreds of issues. It's right. a good idea. Did you want to comment so on that? I have an answer to that, so that's why I came up. Uh, so awesome. first, if you happen to be lucky to be at a sprint, then mentors would help you. They work tirelessly to uh, groom those issues and pick those issues and they know they, some of them they're keeping their heads and some of them they have lists that they can help match you with issues. If you don't be, if you are not so lucky to be at a sprint, then uh, I think that initiatives provide a wide array of different things. So if you are interested in like contributing to something media or something API first or something blocks and layouts, then the initiatives usually have meeting times that you can go to. And they always have stuff that you can do. You can do user testing with them. You can do. You can look at mockups. You can fix typos. You can write documentation, and you can just go in and explain that hey, I'm interested in this, and if you have some issue for me, and they will have an issue for you. And they have a vested interest to make you successful fixing it because you're going to help them uh, achieve their goals. So they're going to help you uh, fix it. If, so if you go to a random issue somewhere, it's it, it has a much higher chance of, of not being looked at any, anymore. But if you go into a team that already has an interest in solving that problem space, then you get, uh, get uh, buddies to help you, get mentors, et cetera. Awesome, thank you. More questions? No more questions? Oh, there's a question. <laughs> Uh, so I'm in agreement about um, basically repeating your words in the past of fostering the community to contribute, being the most value that Drupal can provide. And we're talking about user experience a lot, and I was just looking at the issue queue. I'm wondering if there's any initiative to perhaps survey users who are trying to commit, or you know, trying to commit and contribute to the project and surveying the issue queue, looking at, you know, improving that experience so that for the first time user it looks like something more approachable or something that they can dive into sooner as, a, as one of the primary drivers of getting more people into that queue. So um, basically helping to create, create a better experience for contributing, like yeah. improving the, the user experience of the tools that we have. Is that the question? Um, I think it's a great idea. I actually don't know, to be honest, what we're doing on that area. No, nothing right now. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there's no focused effort on that, it seems, other than incremental improvements. Uh, but I think, um, I think Jess has an answer. <laughs> so that list of 100 contribution areas, like fully half or two thirds of them are specific small changes that we can make, small to medium sized changes we can make to Drupal.org um, that will improve the contributor experience. They range from everything like a general problem of making the list of core components something that a normal human being can understand. So if you want to, if you're looking for, you know, a, the, the question that was asked about how do we decompose the list of issues into something that's relevant to me, well, if we had a component list that allowed you, you know, rather than a hundred different things that allowed you to select a component that's relevant to you, then that would help you find it. Other things like we have all of this arcane terminology in Drupal that Right now, you kind of need someone to sit down with you and explain step by step, okay, here's the first step, here's the second one, or alternately, read a documentation page. Ideally, our issue should tell you that, but there's, there's all kinds of small changes that we can make in the user interface. And those issues are out there, they've been documented. The problem is that there are limited resources that, the, for example, the Drupal Association has to work on them. So what that means is, is someone to go through this list that we hopefully will be publishing um, of all of these 100 plus contribution barriers, some of which have issues already, go through and say, hey, you know, 
I think I could probably help that write that thing that automatically rerolls the patches, or hmm, I have an idea for how to fix the component list, and like maybe I can contribute back to the project module so that Drupal.org can display a small list of multiple components instead of having to pick one from a list of 100. So there, there is a lot of potential work that's already been identified that's out there. It's just that we need, we need resources of people to jump in and do it. Um, so that, that's where I would start. The, not, not visualizing a huge issue queue redesign, but tackling the, the I think Yorai said, the big elephants in the room, the things that we've known forever are problems, and, and starting to fix what we can of them. Awesome. If I can take a second, just to build on what, uh, what Jess shared there. Uh, as someone, as a community person who likes to dabble in some of the Drupal.org work, the Drupal Association staff has done an amazing job in cleaning up and fixing the process of contributing to Drupal.org. <laughs> And there, there, there are some resource issues with that, but, and as Jess says, there's a lot of work. I, I will say that if you can't find one of them, come find me during the sprint tomorrow. We'll get you a site, we'll get you a Drupal.org sandbox, and you can pick off one of those issues and, and, and help scratch your own itch and solve that problem that's been holding you up. And Jeremy, the man behind the mic, has also done an amazing job, so thank you. <laughs> Hi, Dries. Uh, uh, Chris Weber, software engineer at the Nerdery, Drupal Nerd. Um, you, every time when I see Drupal compared to other systems, it's always Amazon Experience Manager, Sitecore, maybe WordPress when we're trying to make jokes. Um, but there are lots of other content management systems out there that, that are worth a good look. Um, I really think we should be looking at uh, Craft CMS, which is another kind of frameworky CMS that shares a lot of similarities with Drupal. I did a podcast on that. I'll give you the link later. Um, and uh, I, I think it, we, we need to do a better job of getting out of the Drupal community and going to different conferences, talking to people who use other content management systems, and maybe apply a bit of our process to people who are not typically our audience, uh, maybe try to find ways of surveying people that are not typically people who would visit your blog and find out about your survey. Um, I don't know what the real answer is, but I think we should do more outside of our normal audience who people um, apply or would reply to the survey. And I almost feel that the, we're, we've chosen a strategic direction based upon the voices of the choir. And uh, I, I'm not sure if we would have the same conclusions if we were to try to survey a broad audience of people who may or may not know what Drupal means. Fair point. Um, I tried hard to get the survey as wide as possible. Um, but it's always hard to get up the islands and to reach those people that have maybe never heard of Drupal, you know. Um, I think in general, I would agree with you that we would benefit from having a good understanding of other players around us. Um, um, I, I try to um, keep tabs of what the rest of the world is doing. Um, definitely would love to see more people try and do the same. Um, you know, we can always learn from others. Um, I think we should. So. I don't know, I don't have a better answer in, in how we can get off the island, but if we all start to look and learn from others, I think we would definitely benefit. So. I'm just wondering um, if there's anybody or any place specific tomorrow for someone who would want to go to a non-code sprint and do documentation or cleaning toilets or that kind of thing um, that would help out. I, I tried last year and um, was foiled in about six different ways because my computer was locked down by my IT department and I couldn't install a local dev and it was um, a little daunting and frustrating uh, when basically I just wanted to write some documentation or help out in other ways and uh, any specific thing to look for tomorrow? Yeah, what's, what's your name? Sorry. Uh, Ray Bartlett with uh, the International Ray. Fund for... Anyone that wants to be Ray's buddy? Well, Tomorrow? Oh, right here. All right. <laughs> All right. So, so another piece to that, by the way. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Chris. Ray, we're totally going to get you hooked up right, with that. We will uh, help you tomorrow. 
Another piece of that, uh, Josh Mitchell, CTO of Drupal Association. Um, we are planning on having a bit of a migration planning sprint related to documentation. That has been one of the major initiatives that we've been working on at the Drupal Association. If you haven't looked at the issue related to it, there's some major changes around documentation. We need this for a lot of the Drupal 8 stuff. We need it to make the experience on Drupal.org a little bit better. Um, some great things in it too, like group maintainership. Um, some concepts that I think are gonna make our documentation way better. So definitely hook up with that because that has been an issue that worked there. And the other thing I would add uh, to what Jess was saying about the, the, the contribution barriers, I, I would actually like to see those treated the same way that we treat core because that's what we did with documentation. We actually did user test all of our wireframing and our designs there. Some great work by the team at the association to make sure that we weren't just implementing code, we were implementing a plan. And that's part of why it's taken a while to roll out is because we did more planning than coding to start with. And so the same thing goes for those contribution barriers. If you can get in there and whiteboard and paper prototype and test it in the contribution sprints, that's just as valuable as giving us some code that we may or may not be able to implement tomorrow. So I uh, don't get discouraged, give us ideas, and that's gonna be better. So thank you. Awesome, yeah, so thank you. So look for Josh or Chris. I, I was curious uh, why you chose blocks and layouts um, as well as the, the, the API stuff. But obviously, I understand with the workflow, somebody's willing to, willing to fund it, but I'm, I'm oh, just curious your thoughts why on that. Why Acquia wants to do these two? Oh, okay. Is that the question, or? It, I, I'm just curious what, why, why those two and not some of the others. All right, um, well, that's a good question. Um, I personally believe strongly in, in sort of the API first model. Um, you know, again, um, you know, looking at what's happening around us, I see a lot of headless uh, CMSs emerge, but also a lot of existing Drupal websites moving to more of a decoupled architecture. And um, and you know, if I look, at, if I think about the long term, I think this is actually you know very strategic. Um, and so that is why we picked that one. Um, blocks and layouts, um, I don't know, it's, there's not really um, a lot of reasonings behind that one. You know, um, could have picked media <laughs> as well, and maybe we should. So, um, yeah, not, nothing special. Um, I guess the one thing that we do have in our advantage is Tim uh, Plunkett is on the team, um, and so he's one of the one of the maintainers of, of blocks and, and so that, that could help us. But if, if you guys think we should pick another one, happy to discuss. But the rest stuff, um, or the API first stuff, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. So, does that help? Yeah. Hey, Frank Carey. Um, so I was wondering, is on the DA team, is there an analytics group? And that might be someplace I'd be interested in contributing back to, where we could sort of look at some of the data Maybe drop some, you know, prompts and surveys on the various pages of Drupal.org and say, "How was your experience today?" Or, you know, "Why was this difficult?" And try to pull that out over time. Yeah, good question. I don't know. I'm looking at Neil here and Rudy. Oh, you want to go to the mic? Sorry, maybe introduce yourself. Um. I'm Ryan Hazard on Mixologic uh, on the infrastructure team. Um, Right now, our analytics are a lot of database queries and spreadsheets, and but it's not formalized. But getting some of that in place would be really awesome. So that's that's something we're looking forward to. We got an additional database set up that we can use to start putting together some like business intelligence dashboards and things. So that's stuff we definitely are hoping to do. So yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Is there an uh, an example of uh, do you, you know something? Something else you've used where you've, you've seen this done effectively or I don't know. If yeah, I think, um, you know, we, the, there are these like, you know, uh, Google Docs that get put together and sometimes they're available and sometimes not. But I think it'd be helpful to know, you know, straight database queries would be really helpful because there's obviously historical data that goes way back and we could really, uh, my interest is sort of uh, machine learning and AI. So, I mean, just from machine learning techniques, we could probably start figuring out, you know, Either where people, like you're talking about the funnel, where are people falling off? You know, it'd be interesting to see, like you know, how long if someone did was a first-time contributor, how long 
do they keep going back and checking the issue queue? And then how long does it take before they fall off? Like some of these interesting questions that I think we'd all come up with that we could just start answering with some analytics. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Hi, Mark Drummond, front end developer at Lullabot. Um, I just wanted to comment that I was really excited by the list of uh, initiatives that were being proposed. Um, I think the, the API first focus is fantastic. I think improving that uh, will be really great. I'll uh, really help move things forward. Um, I think the workflow things, uh, that's pretty awesome as well. And it's neat to see the progress being made on that. Um, and layouts and blocks, um, I, I'm excited about that. Um, one of the things that's important, a lot of the sites I work with are kind of panels based layouts. And so getting the layout things into core is really good. Um, component based theming, which is a little bit further down the track, I'm super excited about. Um, and that's earlier in, we're early in the discussions for how that works. Um, I already kind of mentioned this to Tim about the layouts things. I think there's going to be a lot of overlap in there because I think if we do get some really solid components uh, in Drupal, there will be a need for arbitrary layouts for those so that components work really well for both front-end developers and for the site builders, um, the assembled web. So hopefully we can just, I don't want to slow that train down because I want to see that get in there. Hopefully we can have some discussions early on to make sure that we, um, the things get made in a way that will work well together once all those pieces get put together. So, uh, but exciting work. So thanks for all the work to kind of start thinking about how to put those things together, so. Thank you, I'm glad you're excited. Um, I was basically listening. Um, I mean, I proposed the initiatives between air quotes, but really it's driven by the survey results. So it's all of you that proposed the initiatives. I just translated the data into, um, you know, in, into some initiatives really. Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to add, just on the other question, I think the API first stuff, I feel like, I feel like it's like one of the strategic building blocks for a lot of different things, you know, and, and that's, that's why I'm excited about it as well. So I think it will enable a lot of other things to happen. Um, so. Hi, Lucas Heading. Um, I have my own Drupal shop in Nicaragua. Um, I think media also, and I think that was also in some of your um, documentation uh, is, a, is a really great initi initiative, um, being able to do video and audio and, and pictures and embed those in WYSIWYG and wherever. Um, but I do also see that there's a lot of effort being done over in Europe on that already. So in, in some ways, maybe that's already being addressed and sort of, sort of not maybe quite in the in progress, but pretty close to in progress. But um, definitely needs to be done. Awesome. I agree. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, uh, we are figuring out the process for initiatives and uh, we need to figure out the, the process for the actual teams, how to be productive, how to be effective. What can we do for companies, organizations that would like to fund or how can we uh, create the environment and basically explain the business benefits to more organizations of funding specific work? What do you think we, sh uh, we could be doing there? Well, this has been a long, you know, passion, I guess, of mine. <laughs> um, over the years, I've, I've done a lot of thinking around how to make um, Drupal scale and how to get more organizations involved. And in, I dedicated a whole keynote to it in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. Um, I don't think there's one solution, uh, but one of the things that I proposed was the credit system. And uh, the credit system actually, um, I have an interesting story on that. Like uh, when we were in uh, DrupalCon India, it was three months ago or something, um, you know, Accenture came up to me and they traveled all the way to Mumbai to, to talk. And uh, the first question they asked me, like, how, how can we contribute? I'm like, oh, well, and I went through all the list of ways you can contribute. Uh, and it's like, oh, okay, okay. And, uh, and then I asked why, what, you know, why do you want to contribute? And uh, he said two things. One, Tata Consulting has 400 plus Drupal developers. And I'm struggling to hire Drupal developers. 
And the reason Tata has 400 Drupal developers is because they're allowed to contribute. Uh, and because in India, people really, you know, they value building a resume or a profile for themselves uh, by being able to contribute. And secondly, he said, I just lost a deal, a big deal, to another company. And that company showed their organizational profile and all the things they contributed. And I couldn't make a case that, you know, we were Drupal experts. So we, won, we lost that case against this other company that basically uh, could demonstrate, you know, their contributions. Um, so I'm not saying the credit system is the, the solution to everything, uh, but it is exciting to see how it's starting to help uh, organizations contribute. So. Um, so this is actually a possible oversight in our, in our slides up there. Um, we should have mentioned also that one of the big changes we made for contributors in the past year is that Drupal Core adopted the policy that all kinds of contribution are an issue are credited on Drupal.org. Um, that's reflected on the organization profiles, as Dries says, also on your individual profiles. So it's no longer just if you made a code change to a patch that you're credited in the Git log. Any kind of contribution you make to the issue, whether it is project management and issue triage, whether it is adding documentation, whether it is providing designs for the issue and doing manual testing or giving a usability review. Um, crediting reviewers is one of the things that we started doing in the past year. So um, hopefully that's something that will help us be a, a building block in the future to make it clear that all kinds of contribution are needed. It's not just about the code and, and we actually, we desperately need your, your design expertise um, your project management skills for, for helping us work on the most important things first and so on. Uh, so that's something that I think I would, I would follow Dries's concept. It's not, it's not just for code contributions, it's every kind of contribution you make is then reflected on your profile and your organization's profile. For Core and all of contributed modules, but Core has a very, uh, like we're very dedicated to trying to make sure each issue is credited for all of these types. Awesome. Just, just to finish that, I mean, if you think about most organizations, what they care about is one, customers, and two, being able to hire the best talent, right? And the credit system helps them with, with those things. And then there's a whole bunch of organizations, many of, of whom are in the audience, you know, that contribute for more altruistic reasons, for example, or that get these benefits, but maybe more, you know, indirectly. No. But I think, it's also our responsibility to educate, you know, to to our you know bosses or to to our customers, you know, why they should contribute and how eventually when they do they win. So, uh, my name is Tim Erickson. On on the same topic, I'm really curious about how successful, from my perspective, the D8 Accelerate Fund seemed like it was successful. How big of an impact did that have? Um, was that do you consider that to have been a successful effort, and what did we learn from that moving forward? Um, I, you know, my perspective that is that it was really successful, personally. Um, I'm not sure how we measure that <laughs> um, or how to quantify the impact of it, but uh, it really helped us move things forward much more rapidly. So I, I would say we, we would repeat that again. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on, the, on that specifically, but well. Some people seem to agree. <laughs> so during the, uh, the keynote Q&A uh, the other day, you mentioned that you were open to the major change of moving issue queues to GitHub. That's been talked about on and off for several years. And usually the answer that comes back is, yes, there's a lot of benefit, but there's also these huge holes in GitHub that make it just not work for us or other projects like us, like WordPress or Joomla or other really big projects that are still not on GitHub for various reasons. If that is <clears throat> something that you'd like to see uh, explored again, one, why? Two, how do we address those large gaps that have kept us from going that route before? Certainly there are advantages to it, but we can't do that unless we resolve those uh, those blockers to it. How do we go about addressing that better this time than the last three times we had that conversation? Right. Um, well, I think a couple of things come to mind. One is figuring out the governance 
um, aspect of that, who makes that decision, right? I think that's, that's the first challenge in this case, where there's a lot of different opinions and it's not clear what the exact decision-making process is. So I would, I would start there, like figure out how we make this decision and who, who, who do we empower to make that decision? Is that people in the community? Is that people on the Drupal Association side of things? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, secondly, the other thought uh, is that there's not gonna be an easy, an easy solution and actually, um, just to balance it back specifically to you, and I don't mean that in any, <laughs> in any bad way, but it's a little bit like making the move from procedural to object-oriented, right? It's, it's, you know, in the process, we change a lot, and we'll lose a lot of people because of the change, right? There's a lot of people that will say, we don't want to make that, that transformation. We want to do procedural. At the same time, I agree with you in that I believe we will win a lot more new people, a lot more new people. And so here's an example of a, a big change where we made hard trade-offs between losing people and then you know, gaining people. And I believe the GitHub situation is a little bit similar. Like in the process, if we decide to do this, and it's with an if, if we decide to do this, I think we will upset a bunch of people. And uh, at the same time, I, I do think it will allow us to attract more people. Um, so, but I, I, yeah, I don't know if we can close all the gaps. Um, I think we should try and talk to GitHub, for example, see if they're willing to work with us. Um, I think we could explore GitLab. I think I mentioned that in the keynote too. I have no experience with GitLab myself, so I'm, I'm not the best person to even talk about this. Um, but you know, self-hosting something like GitHub may be a solution. Although I don't think, um, I don't know, I, I don't know enough about GitLab. But so I think we should explore the options um, and and power the right group of people to make a decision. And we need to look at it from the core com the core developers' point of view and uh, the contributors' point of view, but also from the Drupal Association's point of view because you know they are not they end up maintaining all of this uh, in the end. So I think there's multiple different angles uh, to look at this. And uh, yeah, we, need to, we need to figure out which, how we kind of weigh these different aspects. So, since, since you pushed back, back on me, I'll you know, follow that analogy a bit. <laughs> in the case of transitioning Drupal from a procedural system to an OO system, there were places where you know, we could just swap something out for a third party component and go all the way there are places where we could go partway and build our own OO system. There are places where we had bridge code that was semi-procedural, semi-OO for a time and eventually phased it out. So there were a lot of steps we could take to smooth that transition. So yes, you know, there's some people we lose, some we gain, but we could make that a smoother transition over the last five years. With something like GitHub, you know, a lot of the places where there are you know, a disconnect between how GitHub works and how we're used to working, I don't know how we could have that bridge layer, in a sense. Um, you know, the most common example I see is, you know, GitHub pull requests are wonderful when it's one person working on it. They're far better than the issue queue. When you have 10 people bouncing something back and forth, the issue queue is a lot easier to work with. I don't know how we bridge that kind of gap. So, you know, how do we go about figuring out how we bridge those kind of gaps and, you know, if that's a cost-effective way of doing it cost in the more general sense, not just monetary. Um, it's, I guess, you know, we've had this conversation before, how do we have it differently this time, I guess is my question. So, so Peter is saying, I think I hear Peter talking. Oh, we need I to use the microphone. P Peter was saying that, um, so this discussion, um, for, for reference, this discussion was, was visited um, several times over the past years. There is an issue on Drupal.org, which is node 2488266, which is one of the contribution barriers in that Google Doc you saw a screenshot of, it's going to have an issue tag eventually, um, that discuss, yeah, uh, again, 2488266. <laughs> 
six six. No, two four eight eight. Two <laughs> six six. Yeah. <laughs> In any case, the title of the issue is "Improve Git Workflow on Drupal.org by Implementing Issue Workspaces," which you notice doesn't say anything about GitHub. This issue did discuss the pros, the cons of moving to GitHub. Um, and compared like what we would lose versus what we would la gain. At the time of this discussion, um, th it's all outlined in the summary, the reasons for, for that proposed resolution. At the time of the discussion, uh, we, we decided to try to improve Drupal.org um, instead for the reasons that, but un unfortunately this, and maybe Josh can give an update on what the, what the status of this currently is. So that, that, was, that was the, I think that's what Peter was getting at, yeah. So it, it's not just like, oh, we've, we've talked about it but never really done anything with it. There was a lot of, of work and thought and, and planning that went, in, went into the decision at the time, at least. Uh, we wanted to improve Drupal.org. That might not always be the case in the future, but Josh. <laughs> yeah, this is actually, uh, I, this is near and dear to me. I, I feel like the first two years of being CTO for the Drupal Association is the discovery process of figuring out how the hell we would be able to do something like move to GitHub. Um, to give you a sense of, of the scale of it, GitHub replaces like four of our 20 major collaboration services. Four. Uh, there are 16 integration points to those four services. Only four of them actually are solved when you move to GitHub, so you still have 12 integration points that you have to refactor. And these are pretty important re re integration points. These are things like the integration between um, our Git repositories and packaging, how you actually get a copy of uh, the Drupal software. It's also integrations like how we uh, interact with Composer, uh, which is the new Composer endpoints that we just rolled out. And that's going to be a powerful new feature that gets us closer to the way PHP does it, the PHP community in general does it. Um, so it's, it's complicated. Um, I, I actually am a strong believer with, with Dries. I agree with him that we will get more out of um, having GitHub developers interact with Drupal. And we already see this with some of the contrib modules that basically do all the work on GitHub and then they clone uh, over into our repositories so that they can get packaging and updates and everything else. I think that's actually the first step. The first step is an integration where we can show that, yeah, you can do the GitHub process. However, for that entire project, we lose issue credits, which means we don't see those people contributing along with the rest of us. Maybe that's okay, because we don't see all the contributions to Guzzle, we don't see all the contributions to Twig, we don't see all the contributions to Symphony. Maybe it gets treated more like that. Uh, but it does get really complicated when we start talking about that migration for core, and that's one of the reasons why we explored issue workspaces, is because we were like, can, can we actually do this? Um, just on the highest level, it's a big project. You guys remember how long the Git migration took? It took two years, lots of discussion, Great volunteer effort to start, and then throwing out the cash at the contractors to get it over the finish line. And honestly, that's the same kind of project that we'd be looking at. So we, we, need, to, we need to look at it with our eyes open, um, and not just say just or simple or easy when talking about it, because I think that does a great disservice to the complexity of the technology that we put together to have an awesome contribution and collaboration uh, system that we have. So. That's, you know, in, in a summary, I've actually got a blog post that we've been working on that kind of summarizes all this and kind of puts it out there for everybody. Um, because I do think it is one of the most important decisions we have. Um, and if anybody has a bag of money, uh, I would love to, love to do it. So, Lar large, I mean, I'm talking mixed Scrooge bags of money here. Come on. Uh, so, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. All right, I think we're over time. Um, Thanks, everybody, and uh, see you tomorrow. That was Michael's idea. I'm like, oh yeah, duh, that makes total sense. I was trying to type the URL in the doc. Yeah, and then I realized you wouldn't be able to see it, and then I'm like, oh, but I can see it, yeah. Oh, we'll miss you tomorrow. Yeah, I know.
it's a good thing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it'd be two years in a row with a senior birthday. And it's